Hey Ecofictologists, my name is Lovis and I hope you are all doing well and are safe. Um, in trying to figure out what to do for my video this week, uh, all my planned topics seemed... Frivolous might not be the right word, but kind of ir irrelevant right now. Um, I don't have much of a platform yet, but um, I do want to use whatever platform I have to draw attention to the wonderful and beautiful black voices that we have in ecofiction. Some of the most influential books in the genre have been created by authors of colour. Regardless of genre, um, publishing is one of far too many industries where people of colour and uh, underrepresented minorities um, meet resistance, they meet obstacles, they find it very difficult to break in, to be seen, to be heard. And even once they do all that, there's a definite pay discrepancy that cannot be ignored. The hashtag publishing paid me was zooming around Twitter uh, in the last couple weeks, um, and it was meant to highlight this, and some, even some very successful black authors, like some of the ones I'm going to talk about today, um, they receive advances well below their white contemporaries, as though the stories of people of colour have less literal monetary value, which is, of course, preposterous. Online writing competitions and Twitter pitch events are a relatively new addition to the publishing game, but they are immensely helpful in creating events that can target specific types of writers, either um, the genres that they represent or the diversity of the writers themselves. Hashtag DVPit is one such Twitter event that happens twice a year that seeks to amplify uh, the voices of self-identifying historically marginalized authors and illustrators. In this way, agents who are taking part in the pitch event um, only see the pitches of authors who need that extra opportunity to be seen because they are swamped in the publishing industry. When submitting an entry to these kinds of events, even if they're not specifically geared towards uh, diversifying the publishing industry, you can use the hashtag own voices, which signals to the agent that if you are pitching a main character that is a person of color or um, an oppressed minority, um, that this represents a marginalized voice trying to speak out. There are many people who are using their social media platforms to highlight uh, books written by black authors and other authors of colour, and I wanted to do the same in ecofiction. It would be a far less rich genre without the stories of these beautiful creators. I'm going to highlight are of course their eco-fiction works, um, but that is by this is by no means a comprehensive list of their creations, so I highly encourage you to also read their other masterpieces. First up is N.K. Jemisin. She's an American, multi-award winning science fiction and fantasy author, and she's probably best uh, known for her Broken Earth series, although she has several. Her books depict many social and societal themes like oppression and cultural conflict, and she's very outspoken about politics and racism. Like I said, she's probably most well known for her Broken Earth series. Um, each book of the trilogy won the Hugo Award, uh, which made her the first author ever to receive this prestigious award three years in a row. And in winning the Hugo for um, the fifth season, which is the first book in the trilogy, she was the first African-American author to win this award in this category. The Broken Earth series takes place in a secondary world that N.K. Jemisin created, where every few centuries they go through this period of mass extinction and catastrophic climate change, uh, which they call the fifth season, which gives the first book in the trilogy its title. The society is broken up into a kind of caste system, and there are magic users who are a very oppressed group of people. Uh, they're feared and hated for the potentially fatal effect that their magic has. The series battles towards a more hopeful future for everybody. The series is a fascinating example of ecofiction and fantasy, which I definitely want to talk more about. It allows us to be a bit more distanced because it is fantasy, so it's not directly happening in places that we recognize, um, but we can still draw parallels between the catastrophic climate change that is happening in the, in, uh, the Broken Earth series and the climate change and mass extinction that we are seeing in our own world. N.K. Jemisin herself has said that when she was growing up, she didn't really see um, being a published science 
fiction author as being a possibility for her because she didn't see very many uh, black authors, let alone black women, uh, in science fiction until she discovered the works of Octavia Butler, who we are going to talk about right now. Octavia Butler is an African-American science fiction writer and she's an absolutely huge name in uh, the genre of eco-fiction and she has many awards to her name including a Hugo and a Nebula award. She is known for tackling many societal issues in her books uh, including politics, segregation and religion as well as environmental conflict and she's often referred to as the mother of Afrofuturism which is a cultural philosophy that seeks a future where black and African culture, art, technology um, is no longer marginalized but is celebrated. She was one of the early authors to address climate change in her books before ecofiction and cli-fi became more popular and more mainstream. A title that is mentioned often is uh, The Parable of the Sower, the first in the Earthseed series followed by Parable of the Talents. Um, a, a planned third in the series Parable of the Trickster was unfortunately not finished before Octavia Butler's death in 2006. The first book, Parable of the Sower, is a near-future young adult dystopian novel which portrays the life of a young black girl who has lost her family in war-torn Southern California amidst rising seas, uh, water shortages and disease. And her hyper-empathy makes her very sensitive to the pain of others. It has been said that Parable of the Sower is one of those books that was speculative when it was written, um, but we can see it already coming true, which makes it almost prophetic. Another author who is sometimes mentioned in conversations about Afrofuturism or African futurism, as she prefers it to be referred to, is Nnedi Okorafor, um, a Nigerian-American writer who writes African-based science fiction, fantasy, and magical realism with many an award to her name. Incidentally, she's actually working on a screenplay adaptation of Octavia Butler's Wild Seed. Her stories are often set in West Africa, sometimes a far future Africa, um, and she uses the framework of fantasy to explore difficult issues like racism, political violence, corruption, and environmental destruction. Nnedi Okorafor's work uh, most often takes inspiration from the land, the culture, the folklore of Africa, and her stories reflect a connection to and a love for these things. Her short story, Spider the Artist, is set in a future Nigeria where the devastation of the environment has led to the dying of, of fish in the creeks and the suffering of people who are drinking the poisonous waters while creatures called Anansi droids or zombies um, guard a pipeline that the government uses to maintain control over its people. She was also invited by WBEZ, Chicago Public Media, to take part in a project called After Water um, to write a story about the potential fate of the Great Lakes when climate change has made access to clean water more and more difficult. After Water pairs writers with scientists to speculate how society deals with water shortages. Nnedi Okorafor wrote a short story called Poison Fish, where fish released into uh, the polluted waters of Lake Michigan bioluminesce where the pollution is highest. The protagonist, Udara, makes a point of saying, uh, we are all polluted, we are not separate from the earth, we are part of it. When asked about the role of uh, artists and writers, specifically sci-fi writers, in getting people to think about the future, um, Okorafor says that stories give people a practice run. Um, to think about the future without having to live it. And maybe it will inspire readers to be inventors, which is something that sci-fi has always done. She describes herself as an irrational optimist, um, even though she writes a lot of post-apocalyptic stories, she can't bear to think about a world without hope. So she clings to the belief that the Earth can adapt to even our worst attempts at destruction. The love for Nigeria brings us to our next author, um, Helon Habila, uh, originally from northern Nigeria, who has received a lot of attention for his emotional and realistic portrayals of Nigeria's 
history of oppression, dictatorships and environmental destruction. Habila was a journalist himself and draws on, the, on his experiences for his book Oil on Water, which lays bare the human cost of the oil industry in the Niger Delta, a fictional story set against a very real and very harrowing time. Nigeria is the world's seventh largest producer of oil and has experienced the difficulties that come with that kind of exploitation oil spills, gas flares, uh, unfair distribution of wealth, and of course the devastation of farmland. People were forced to relocate their villages with no support from the government. The anger and abandonment felt by these people drove them to violence and they started kidnapping oil workers, asking for ransom and making demands. Oil on Water tells the story of two journalists who are sent to find out whether the kidnapped wife of an oil baron was still alive before the ransom was paid. Through the eyes of these journalists, the reader learns about the effects that oil exploration has had. Habila also uses this book to question the power of journalism to encourage change. Interestingly, this idea actually started as a movie script. Halon Habila was approached by a company who wanted to make a film about this because it was in the news a lot and it was very topical. But the project fell apart because the company wanted to focus more on the violence and the kidnapping while Habila really wanted to highlight how the environment was irretrievably destroyed over the course of just one generation and how that drove people to the said violence. And he saw that as being the real tragedy of the situation. Uh, so he wrote the novel instead and thank goodness he did. In an interview with Mary Woodbury at Dragonfly Eco, Helon Habila said he thinks all authors and writers uh, should write about the environment if they have opportunity and also the inspiration. Habila wants to encourage anyone with a platform to use it to talk about this issue and not to let propaganda go unchallenged uh, because the governments don't seem to want to do anything about it. The last author I want to highlight is Tochi Onyebuchi, an American science fiction writer and civil rights lawyer of Nigerian descent. Onyebuchi takes so much inspiration from Nigeria's war-torn past and combines it with his love of science fiction and uh, creating strong black characters who are able to stand up and fight for their own freedom and do it in a future Africa. He says as he was growing up he didn't see a lot of people who looked like him in science fiction books so he decided to write them himself. He also wanted to represent the experiences of his mother uh, whose childhood was disrupted by the Biafran War in Nigeria in the late 1960s. He did this with his young adult series War Girls. War Girls is set in the year 2172, where climate change and nuclear disasters have uh, rendered much of the world unlivable and have driven people off planet into space colonies in the sky. What's left of the earth is war torn and um, soldiers are fitted with bionic limbs and artificial organs to withstand the harsh climate. The story follows two sisters known as War Girls um, who dream of a better future and will fight to get it. And although I know it isn't an eco-fiction novel, I do want to highlight Tochi Onyebuchi's um, most recent novel, Riot Baby, because it is uh, very topical right now. It was written in response to a spate of uh, officer-involved killings of black Americans, uh, which were in the news in 2014-2015. He said he wanted to use his talents as a writer as an act of service to the cause of liberation. I unfortunately don't have time to talk about all the beautiful black voices in ecofiction. There are many, um, but I hope I have shown you the, the breadth and the depth and the emotion that these people bring to the genre. The purpose of ecofiction is to allow readers to confront truths about their own lives uh, in a medium that allows them to have perhaps a bit more of an open mind than a situation where they're in confrontation or listening to a lecture. It might seem that the word ecofiction means that those truths have to be purely ecological, but um, ecology and our impact on the planet is not separate from societal values and uh, inequality and oppression. It is a sad truth that the effects of climate change, both societal and ecological effects, will be felt first and most acutely by those who do not have the support and protection of their governments. That is me out of time, uh, but I hope I have inspired you to go and read, to diversify your bookshelves, and to appreciate the gift that these people have given us. 
they've trusted us with their stories and now it's up to us to be worthy of that trust. Um, I will see you next week, eco-fictologists. Black lives matter and your stories do too. Be safe.